Welcome to the Nerd Stalker Tech Week Update Podcast. Here I am, Adolfo Front at Nerd Stalker at Twitter with my friend. I'm Greg Vlory, aka Social Greg on Twitter. How's it going, man? Good. It's a, a, a great week here in San Francisco with all the stuff going on. Oh, huh? everything's going on. But one of the awesome things actually that went on was uh, the recording of the first Social Time. Why don't you tell us about that? That was great. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, we're, we we uh, Nerd Stalker and uh, the Social Media Sean, uh, we. We basically uh, launched a new podcast uh, based on social media called Social Time, and uh, that'll be on Google Plus uh, Hangout. Uh, you can see it live as we're actually talking about that, and we encourage a lot of people to interact with it on Google Plus. But it'll be a weekly event to kind of talk about just social media, uh, social media in general. There's a lot of stuff happening with Facebook, LinkedIn is doing a lot of changes, and and Twitter is doing a lot of changes with their API, as you know. So uh, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about I think social media, Sean. Um, we'll We'll also be giving tips yeah. as well, which will yeah. be kind of cool. Uh, we're going to start sharing the screen in Google Plus and just try to, you know, walk a person to how they do a better post in Facebook, how they how they could uh, improve their profile page, possibly. You know, yeah. uh, what is the size of a, I don't know, a, a, a cover cover picture on on Facebook, that type right. of thing. So anyway, that's this the is, stuff we're going to try to cover. This is great, man. I learned a lot, like listening to you guys. You know, then I I fancy myself a knower of the tech, you know, of the techs. But, uh, you know, uh, listen to that and, and both of your insight, you're right. I mean, it's almost a disservice to call them tips because it, it really was uh, an education in a, a lot of the stuff that I had no idea about. So it was very cool. No, thank you. And then so uh, we'll, we'll focus on tech here in our, our Nerd Soccer Tech Week podcast. So uh, that, that, that's cool as well, right? So, right on, right on. Let's, so let's get right into it, my man. You got the All first right. story, two networks, one company. T-Mobile explains why it's Metro PCS. PCS deal can work. Well, as you know, uh, um, T-Mobile announced last week that uh, they acquired uh, Metro PCS. Well, it's really 78% of a new company of Deutsche Telekom, right? But uh, but anyway, uh, you know, th there was a there was a fact that came out last week that concerned a lot of uh, outsiders and investors. The fact that the two companies have used a different type of network technology. So fast backward to guess what? Sprint, Nextel. So. Um, I think uh, the interview from uh, Ina Fried uh, of All Things Digital, uh, thank you for that. Uh, she talked to the uh, head technologist, CTO of uh, T-Mobile, and just tried to get their get his insight on how are they migrating, how are they going to do this, or are they, or are they going to uh, just fail in, in, just like uh, Sprint Nextel was, right? So, so he she interviewed him, and and you know some things came out. You know, uh, the, the both companies have been moving towards a similar generation LTE network, so that's really where the energy is and the whole strategy of it really is to move the metro pcs people immediately onto the t-mobile network and then consolidate it at that point and so he said that you know they don't see any issues in that working not working so um you know it isn't about integrating networks it's really moving metro pcs to a bigger and stronger conversion network so you know it was kind of interesting this week that they talked about that it was kind of something in the backstory that kind of started to come out when and raised eyebrows and concerns amongst the investors and outsiders so as i said earlier so that was interesting i mean you know what i what do you think about these these mergers? It seems like maybe it's this, the right thing to do. Yeah, this, because of all this these could be interesting because I'm, right? I'm thinking the big two, right? We have AT and T and Verizon, and then we have Sprint, kind of under them, trying to talk about mm. them. But when you think of uh, Metro PCS and T-Mobile, you think of smaller scale, lower scale, entry level, a different income bracket. Let's be frank here. And uh, <laughs> those two merging together would kind of make almost like a, a Sprint type of thing. I don't think they quite have the network that Sprint does, even on that scale, but. I think it's helpful. Anyone mm. that can, you know, get up there and start competing with uh, some of these other dogs it would be good. Then again, at the bottom, the bottom end uh, of all these networks, very interesting business going on. Um, I, I think actually that model is probably the future more so than these giant sort of oligarchies. But um, yeah, we mm. shall see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think story. you know, it, let's let's hope that the uh, mobile phone guys do the same thing, huh? But anyway, uh, let's go on to your story. Supreme Court case will decide whether you're you own your own stuff. That sounds familiar. Yeah, man. So <laughs> thanks to uh, Cory Doctorow for this story from Boing Boing. Uh, this is actually a very very important case that's not getting a lot of uh, attention. Apparently, is what the media is starting to say here. <clears throat> the tech media, anyways. Uh, writing in Market Watch, Jennifer Waters explains the implications of a Supreme court case. It's called Kirstang versus John Wiley and Sons, uh, which turns on the question of whether you have the right to resell things you buy out of the country. 
or whether the copyrights embodied by your phones, Whoa. clothes, gadgets, books, music, DVDs, and other possessions mean that you can't sell your stuff without permission from the original manufacturer. What? So following Wiley's theory, uh, you don't really own most of your possessions. You only share ownership of your goods uh, with the companies that made the goods you bought from them. And they get a veto, essentially, over your disposal of them and can also demand a cut uh, of the proceeds. So this is kind of a huge decision here that that uh, that that could uh, sort of pave the way for a lot of this uh, copyright enforcement. And I'm sure big companies and manufacturers would love this um, this thing to pass, you know, because we're typically here in the States, we're used to, I buy a book, I can resell it at some secondhand bookstore or something like that, right? I buy a phone, I can resell it on Amazon or whatever. And, and you know, people are doing that here and they're selling iPhone 5s in China or whatever. And uh, I'm sure the case is people go to Japan also and Korea and buy you know, really cool technology, bring it back here and resell it to friends and stuff, right? Well, if this thing passes, yeah, absolutely. no go. The company can say, hey, man, you broke the law or, or you can do that, but we get a cut of that sale. I mean, yeah, and what happens to you know, uh, you know, networks like eBay that that, that encourage all that, <laughs> you know, that law passes, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? You know, they they owe some kind of royalty fee yeah. back to these yeah. guys who originally owe that. Yeah. Oh, come on. Come so, on. so it's come really on. interesting what a quiet story this is. Yet, yet it's such a it's a it's such a pivotal decision. If the Supreme Court right makes the decision, so uh, people, you might want to you know get a little bit informed about this. Go check out Boing Boing Cory Doctorow's story. Cool. So, Greg, Good Nissan, job. Terra, concept car, packs a detachable tablet dashboard? What? Well, I I, I have two <laughs> Nissan stories, and I'm, no, I'm not getting paid by Nissan. <laughs> I, I only could wish that. But uh, anyway, uh, this is from uh, Latif Salman from uh, Uber Gizmo for this. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, the Paris Motor Show is on right now, and it's really known to bring out the creative side of the auto manufacturers. You know, you know, you think of Paris, art, everything, you know. So, so you know, it's a, it's a a two-day uh, uh, creative art art auto event is, is the best way I could describe. So, so usually the manufacturers venture to show their futuristic ideas, right? And so Nissan this week uh, t brought out the unwrapped uh, Terra uh, T uh, little E R R A. It's a it's a concept car. Um, you know, not only is it is it kind of based on the Nissan Leaf, I mean, it's all electric. But the, right. the one thing that caught my eye was it comes with a removable tablet that that fits in the in the dashboard. And uh, we'll show you a picture on that, or you can go to the link and see the picture of it from Uber Gizmo. But the tablet sits really right in front of you, behind the steering wheel, just like a dashboard. And that means all the all the functions that are performed by the dashboard will be on your tablet. But the thing is, you could remove it and bring it along with you and surf the internet at Starbucks. Wow. Wow. Then go back in your car and put it back in your car wow. again. Oh. Um, I, you know, but it brings up some interesting things. You know, um, you could maybe use it for entertainment. You know, you get anything streaming uh, live, either Google Music or St uh, Spotify or whatever you want. Um, it could mean something like that for this kind of concept. It could mean, you know, navigation becomes a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, the connectivity to your car to uh, go, becomes Nissan. a lot easier. Yeah, yeah I, I thought that was kind it's of good cool. To, but, good to hear but, some future I mean, tech coming from these companies, you know? Yeah, well, they're so old school, right? They yeah. just want to make their own dashboard. But I, I have a question for you that I want to discuss with you on yeah. this one. Would you trust these tablets to control your car, though? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a big proponent of the Google self-driving car, so maybe. True. I, you know, I, yeah. I would love self-driving cars <laughs> myself. I'm like, let's go forward and get humans out of the equation because we are the problem with this whole thing, I think. In my opinion. That's right. We'll, we'll lower our insurance char uh, 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 premiums because of that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Humans, not reliable. Quote, Adolfo. <laughs> That is great. So anyway, let's move on to the next one. I have yeah. another Nissan after that talking about driverless cars. But um, Android users outraged over Motorola's broken promise? Yeah, outraged is a nice word. I call it pissed off. Um, yeah, so there's uh, – Motorola pretty much came out and promised uh, that, uh, you know, all of their phones, if not a certain amount of them, would be upgradable to ice cream sandwich, right? Um, from gingerbread, yeah. I believe. Right. And That's turns out there's heard, like yeah. three or four lines, uh, one of them being the Photon and, and a few other ones, uh, that they've suddenly just said, you know what? No go. We're not going to upgrade these things to Ice Cream Sandwich. And, um, you know, there's some 
people out there who actually bought these phones based on that decision. They were like, oh, should I go with this one? Well, this one's probably affordable, meets my family's needs. I'm going to buy it knowing that this is going to be upgraded to ice cream sandwich for those mm, that, sure, you know, that sure. it matters. And uh, based on that word. And so they're outraged. And there's a huge um, – well, there's a Twitter you know, uh, thing going on. I think it's MotoFail or something like that, um, uh, the hashtag, um, where, where they're getting out there and they're complaining. A lot of them are talking about uh, filing complaints with Better Business Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure we'll see a lawsuit here. Uh, Motorola has come back and said, hey, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, but we just uh, – we can't do it. We can't. Uh, we've decided to make this hard call, is what they said, and uh, you know, only go forward and upgrade a few of these phones. Support, uh, you know, the upgrade of the operating system for a few of these phones because of the sheer uh, uh, maintenance cost, customer service cost, whatever, would just not be worth it for them. So, the, you know, this brings up another business question. Then, um, are we going to see? Because choice is good, right? That's uh, the whole Android thing: is choice, choice, choice. And we're seeing all of these right. Android phones. But are we going to see these companies start to streamline their their phones now that they really can't um, you know, um, upgrade these phones' operating systems or really support them in the long run or longer ish run, uh, or or are we going to see this type of behavior where some phones get uh, you know are, are upgradable and some aren't essentially with their operating system? We saw Microsoft do this with the Windows Phone Seven. Uh, oh well, going to yeah, we've seen that, and uh, you know it's not too cool. I think owners. It's, so this whole argument of openness and and a few, you know how flexibility and stuff like that again is sort of breaking down. We're seeing a narrowing of uh, certain phones being mm. upgradable, and also does it even matter? A lot of people, general users, do they really even care about operating system upgrades? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. My my feeling on this, is, Adolfo, is this that. You know, I, I think on the uh, I used to be a product manager, so I, I could talk about product features and and a lot of this. And I'm sure the product managers at Motorola are getting death threats and uh, <laughs> bomb, bomb scares right now, but because right, right. of all this. But 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 you know, it is it is a, a nightmare to manage a lot of this stuff and the resources it takes to manage legacy items. Yeah. You know, and um, you know, I'm sure someone out there is going to take and fork something that'll work <laughs> onto those older devices. Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe you know, cyanogen or you know, something but, like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I, I think they're, they're starting to come to the reality of this this whole uh, you know product management nightmare that they're creating by saying that everything is open. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, the you know? weird the weird thing about this is that Motorola actually stated we are, these phones are going to be upgradable. And then these That's people true. purchased these phones, and they essentially reneged on that verbal agreement. Oh man, that's a mess. Good luck with that. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> this hurts the brand that. already. That's already kind of hurt, right? Yeah. I had a Motorola right. Droid X, and all I do is complain about it on this show, right? So I don't know. I mean, I think they might have to change the brand from Motorola to Google eventually, just to get that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So great, <laughs> man. Know. Uh, yeah. What is this? Radio Shack accused of selling whoa, what? Some <laughs> nasty, nasty, porn filled yeah. Yeah. phones. Yeah, well, Radio well, Shack. You buy a phone. This is where yeah, I buy I diodes and potentiometers and stuff. <laughs> and cables and porn and microphones. apparently. Yeah, well, you, you you buy a new iPhone, right? It comes preloaded with some great apps to get you started, right? But but when one one woman and a thirteen year old daughter uh, started up their uh, their phones. They saw something preloaded that wasn't really great. Hardcore pornography. Hey oh so, 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 yeah. Oh my god. You know. So um Marsha Jones, uh DeKalb County, kind of Georgia, bought what was believed to be uh two new uh phones. And it turns out they weren't iPhones. It was reported in matchable iPhones, but they were actually HTC phones, Evos, actually, at their local radio shack. And it turns out they were buying refurbished phones. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, one was filled with X-rated images, graphic enough to send her daughter into counseling, as she claims. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so she's seeing both Radio Shack and Sprint, and Sprint, you know, uh, the company who licensed the phone. Um, so it, it was crazy. Uh, you know, there were two HTC Evo 4G phones, and, uh, uh, you know, I saw this was going like, oh, my God, Radio Shack. You can't erase the memory? Come on. Or are your employees now doing pornographic images on the side to earn more money because you're paying them very little wages? Yeah, I, w I wonder <laughs> so. what the process is for you know in taking these refurbished phones and yeah, you know wiping them or not, or, or are they just looking for functionality? Oh, this generally works, you know. 
uh, you would think there'd yeah. be a re- reformat of some sort. I mean, you know, there has to be. I, I, I can't imagine that he couldn't do that, but it's just, wow. you know, it's just, just, you know, one that escaped, but it's always the one that escapes and ends up screwing the companies, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so regardless of the process, Counseling. right? The pro- process, yeah. Okay. yeah, I know. This must be this Georgia. Is, this is, I love you, oh, Georgia. This, is, <laughs> this will I be a you. heavy duty price to pay. <laughs> anyway, let's go on to yours. The next one is Zynga's. Acquisition? What? Yeah. Torch? Nearly five hundred thousand days. That's why they're losing money. <laughs> so yeah, the own G pop miss is uh, what they're calling it here. So yeah, from the story here uh, from CNET, uh, here's how deep the knife will cut via CNET's Donna Tam. The company said it will write off between eighty-five to ninety-five million related uh, to the OMG pop acquisition. Uh, I believe that was uh, what is it? The, the Hangman type game that they were doing? Draw something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Remember yeah. that was red hot. Anyways, those figures hurt all the more when put into perspective. Zanga paid between one hundred eighty to two hundred and ten million for OMG Pop. The final thirty million dollar of the deal was structured as an earnout. Uh, to have any fun, to have some uh, fun with these numbers, fun in quotes. Um, they pick. They had to pick a starting point, right? At, a point zero, so here we go with math, if you will. As the deal was first announced or broken to the media on March 21st, uh, they use uh, that as their baseline. Well, from Alpha, how many days since the 21st? 197 is the calculation, right? As Zango will write down between 85 and 95 million. The math is pretty simple. It's uh, 85 million divided by that 197 number, and then you get your equaling like 431, essentially about $432,000 in daily losses, or uh, the 95 million divided by 197, you're around 482,000 in daily losses. Ouch, is what they say here. So this is a, a brutal, brutal miss with Zenga, uh, which is really unfortunate. Zenga is a company real close to, to, to me here, and uh, – you know, there's a lot of oh, jobs right. at stake here, and there's a lot of people. They they have a massive building here, which used to be the Sega building, and uh, oh, I, yeah, I'm really yeah, hoping right. they turn they turn it around. And I never really count out Zanga because they always seem to come back with some sort of crazy hit or something like that. Mark Pincus seems to be a smart guy, but this OMG Pop um, acquisition is one of those you just scratch your heads and just like, what the hell, you know? Almost like the Instagram sort of comparison to Facebook, but perhaps worse because um, the draw something app which was such a hit for such a short amount of time a lot of people you know are in retrospect are seeing what a brilliant move it was by the omg pop team to which is handful of people whatever um to go and sell this this company to them and get out at the perfect time perfect time and they're walking away with a ton of money and zanga is left with the you know with a gaping wound just hemorrhaging hemorrhaging money here I mean, companies do that all the time, right? They they make some crazy, crazy acquisitions, and you know, and especially you know, if they were making a lot of money, no one would even care, right? <laughs> no one would really care about this, right? right? But now that they said they couldn't even make their numbers, you know, everyone is trying to figure out why, why, why. Right. So, so I, yeah, I, you know, maybe they should just go private again. Speed round. Speed round. Speed round. Speed round. I love speed speed round. round. <laughs> Yeah, so Apple's just begun notifying the first wave of customers who order the company's new Lightning to 30-pin adapter that their orders are now shipping. According to Mac Rumors, they've received word from several readers located in Australia that their orders are now in transit. With one reader's shipping notification indicating that his shipment is due to be delivered on October 9th, uh, Apple's delivering two versions of the adapter, one for 30 bucks, a uh, direct plug adapter, and a $40 adapter with a short cable. The adapters allow users to connect their, you know, lightning-enabled devices, their new lightning-enabled devices, such as the iPhone 5, which I have right here, um, <laughs> and forthcoming iPod Touch and iPod Nano models uh, to docks and other accessories designed for a previous 30-pin dock connector. So for all you whiners out there crying about your connections and this and that, here it comes. <laughs> Don't worry. Help is on the way. Oh, man. You whiners out there, I love it. Speed round. I love it. Speed round. Okay, I, I got another Nissan uh, article. We got Nissan takes a wraps off driverless car concept. Isn't that cool? We were just talking about tech, and now this is the driverless car concept uh, taking on Google. So thanks to Shirley Brady of uh, Brand Channel for this. Uh, turns out Google isn't the only one uh, developing a, a driverless car, right? Uh, so at SeaTech, uh, Asia's biggest tech uh, show in um, – 
uh, Tokyo um, this last uh, this last week. Um, uh, Nissan has unveiled the NSC2015. <laughs> what the hell? I of don't course. Know what the hell that number is, you know. But it's basically a prototype version of the Lisa, Leaf electric vehicle. Cool. And uh, basically at this show, they – it allowed uh, people to get in it, and it will drive around in a small circle, just driverless. So it was just kind of an interesting thing to just check out. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, that, that it could do, you know, park itself, uh, come when you call it. So this is basically the new man's best friend. Yeah. The bad <laughs> so, car. Yeah. 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 I mean, or Kit from uh, whatever that show Night was, Rider. you know, that type of thing. Yeah, come Night on. Rider. Night Rider. Night Rider. Nine right there. That's right. Well, we're not at the kit level yet, but it's getting close. If you can call it, it'll come. So anyway, that's, uh, awesome. that's that was a that was good for Nissan. So hats off to you again, yeah. Nissan, for another story in our uh, Tech Week podcast. Very cool. Yeah. So my next story: the bubble that wasn't. What happened to people discovery apps? You know, at South by Southwest, there was all these hypes about like uh, you know all highlight and all these other type of uh, applications. I think Scoble called it. This is the coolest app ever. And um, all these people discovery apps, and then suddenly, you know, quiet, quiet time. So <laughs> the story here from The Verge, thanks to them, they say the problem with acquiring users as a people discovery app, providing a real utility that brings people back for more. A lot of these apps come from a problem that 99% of people don't have. <laughs> That's a problem right there. Uh, <laughs> so instead of focusing on discovering great places you can go with your friends and family, the app focus on uh, discovering people outside of your social circle during your free time uh, most people go home after work and watch TV. It's a it's a young college kids problem, is is what these uh, analysts say. Uh, Foursquare some time ago realized that uh, seeing where your friends are isn't compelling enough, so it shifted its focus to providing the best possible recommendations for places to go with your friends. It's a a lot like when uh, the web emerged in the early '90s. It took us some time to figure out the norms, use cases, and new ways of using this technology, but eventually we did, right? And the world was uh, forever transformed. So that's sort of the argument here is that, you know, a lot of these type of companies and apps are, are sort of, you know, Foursquare is probably the early-ish example of this have pivoted, right, for lack of a better – the fancy current word, uh, into finding these these better use cases. Because at first that sure, was like it sure. seems all sexy. Find your friends and this and that, you know, but – or find new friends and identify who are these strangers in the room. But who wants to go into a room and look at your phone and, and you see someone and I know your name, walk up to them and say, hey – Greg, you don't know me, but you're on my phone. Right. So, Raspberry Pi and Broadcom uh, get together. So, last week, uh, Broadcom, the network and communications giant, you, you know, but we never hear too much about it anymore, uh, gave a popular Linux computer to middle school students uh, a, a program to kind of teach them how to uh, code. Uh, with They don't need any background in programming. Uh, so, um, you know, it's dubbed the Broadcom Master's Program, and, and it, it's supposed to attract kids to – you know, math, applied science, technology, engineering, rising stars, that type of thing. But it really replaces the, the traditional um, science fair uh, with uh, teaching the kids computer skills. So uh, it, it was cool. It was a cool event. But, you know, we talked about the Raspberry Pi. Or actually, I did an interview with someone who used the Raspberry Pi um, for, um, you know, connecting with the seniors because it was just yeah. a, a cheap, easier computer yeah. to use. Yeah, right? so neat. And, um and I think that that's something that uh, was kind of cool for a twenty-five dollar computer. That's I mean, exciting. come on, that's you know, great. isn't that? Yeah, yeah. 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 Bridges the gap, these right? Cases, yeah. This is yeah. fantastic. Isn't that good? So anyway, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up to everyone's attention that you know they're 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 they're, they're close. People are trying to close that that digital divide. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is one way to do that. So tip time. Anyway, let's tip time. Tip, tip time. time. Okay, what are you up to there, man? <laughs> so yeah, What's so my tip? tip is webplatform.org. Uh, so thanks to Adobe's blog for this. Uh, for all you web developers out there, this is uh, the W3C in collaboration with Adobe, Apple, Facebook, Google, HP, Microsoft, Mozilla, Nokia, and Opera is announcing the alpha release of Web Platform Docs, a new web destination that will become the definitive resource is what they hope for all open web technologies. You can find the W3C mm -hmm. press release, uh, you know, uh, on the W3C site. Uh, the web platform documentation will include API documentation, information or browser compatibility, examples, status of specifications. And the WPD project will be open and community driven. So again, you can go to webplatform.org for more information. What's so great about this is as a web developer, uh, you know, when I'm, I'm 
developing for different browsers and stuff like that, I typically have to right. go to all these different locations, you know, whether it's Mozilla's uh, site for information developer network or Google's developer site and Apple's best, you know, based for iOS and et cetera, development uh, best practices. Uh, I'm, I'm going, wasting time all over the place of the web trying to find this information. And to, what they're trying to do is consolidate in one to save this time. So if you can sign nice. up, go to webplatform.org, sign it up. Um, it's a really helpful sort of resource here. So, Greg, your tip, man. We hate fixing devices or we hate calling the uh, tech tech support center or unless you're a masochist or something like that, right? That's right. So, so um, w there's this new app, thanks to uh, Leslie Horn of Gizmodo uh, for this one, uh, called Fixia, an app that uh, basically tells you how to repair broken belongings, yeah. right? Uh, and it's basically crowdsourcing, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you... you you know, in the older days, you used to go to these really kind of, you know, vertical sites, you know, to try to, you know, hook up with motorcycle people, and they'll, 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 they'll tell you how to fix something almost, you know, for free. You don't have to really get anyone if you want to put your uh, elbow grease into it, right? But, you know, uh, fix you, uh, check it out. Um, you know, you could just record your question on an iPhone camera, and one of the Fixia's community of more than 25 million people, apparently, will troubleshoot it for you. Um, help you patch the problem, whether it's a dishwasher or, or microwave, DVD player, motorcycle, whatever. So anyway, check that out. Uh, we'll have that link on there. And uh, it, uh, crowdsourcing fixing is, is a good thing. Cool, man. So, so events. What do we got coming up, Greg? Wow. Wow, dude. We have a busy week this week. So on Tuesday, we got uh, on the 8th, we got SF Music Tech, uh, or, or actually on, on the 9th, I'm sorry, on the 9th, uh, Hotel Kabuki, 9 to 6 p.m., uh, Music Tech, run by our friend Brian Zisk. Uh, uh, talks on anything about Music Tech. It's really kind of a cool event. It's been yeah. running for a while now. I don't know how many years, but it's been Lots a while time, now. Yeah, um, yeah and, and uh, you know, catch that. Um, uh, on the 10th, <laughs> we have SF New Tech, uh, the e-commerce uh, uh, event, uh, right. Your So Money, with, with uh, people like uh, Shopify will be there, um, nice. Kajingle, uh, check ya. Um, you know, if you know those people, yeah. uh, come check it out at 119 Utah Street, uh, San Francisco, California. So um, then next up, uh, we have uh, Trans Bay Fest towards the end of the week. Uh, Nurse Soccer is uh, proud to be the media uh, sponsor, and uh, uh, we're going to cover the event, uh, the first event uh, to talk about trans media. There's an opening night on Friday, the 12th. You can still buy tickets for, and uh, there will be an all-day event um, uh, centralizing the Yerba Buena area on the 13th. So uh, uh, catch them, uh, catch it on our website, and you do that. And and anyway, what's what's the event that you always go to and you had some great interviews about? Okay, thanks to Cass Phillips. She puts on this amazing uh, one-day conference called FailCon. It's on October 22nd at the Julia Morgan Ballroom here in lovely San Francisco. For more information, go to thefailcon.com. Uh, that's all one word. Uh, yeah, it's uh, entrepreneurs, investors, developers, and designers uh, to study their own and others' failures and prepare for success. So very interesting. They got these amazing speakers like Ben Hub from uh, you know Cheeseburger mm -hmm. Network and mm -hmm. uh, the CEO of Joie de Vivre and a ton of amazing speakers and, and thought leaders on this whole thing. Definitely worth your while. Very affordable. One day won't eat up a lot of your time and uh, run extremely well. So check it out uh, at thefailcon.com. We are also a media sponsor for that. Very proud media sponsor for that. And happy to uh, help out with that. Um, yeah, so Greg, uh, if we want to uh, add to uh, the stories here, how can we uh, suggest that stuff? Well, uh, you could use uh, the hashtag NRDSDK, um, and, and you get a hold of us that way and suggest any stories to us, as well as, you know, uh, you could go to nursehawker.com, uh, which has all our great stories on there, and you could also link up with us there. Um, you can catch us on iTunes audio and video. Uh, you could please rate us. And on our YouTube channel, Nerdstalker TV. And also catch us on the 24 by 7 channel of Nerdstalker. I broadcast TV with all our podcasts running in between music and, and the podcast that we have done in the last 41 episodes, right? So anyway, hey, if they, and if they get a hold of you, Adolfo, how do they do that? So you can reach me on Twitter at Nerdstalker. Feel free to email me, email Adolfo, that's A-D-O-L-F-O, -O, at gmail.com. How about you, Greg? Well... I am Social Greg on Twitter. You catch me on socialgreg at nerdsoccer.com. Or, hey, you can catch me on Google Plus now. So uh, reach out to me. All I'm, right. I'm, I'm always there for you. Awesome. Well, thanks for <laughs> listening and uh, watching, everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Be careful out there. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. I, there's this, you know.